row again on a Sunday from 9 to 9.30, uh, each and every Sunday. I try to do it my best to get here to help you make that Garden of Weeden turn into the Garden of Eden, to help you get the bugs out of there and the blooms in, and also to make sure that you have the best harvest ever and maybe a nice green lawn. Is that possible? Well, if you it is possible, I'm the guy that can answer the questions in the community that we have here on this uh, live that we do each and every week is fantastic to help answer the questions that I don't get to. So if you take a look and you have a question, you go into the comments, but let's say that uh, you know some of the answers to some of those questions in the comment, I encourage you to get there and to answer those and help this community keep growing on. Uh, for those that don't know me, maybe joining for the first time, Frankie Flower is my real name, Frank Farragini. Uh, I am a resident of Bradford, Ontario, where my family has a garden center as well as we're greenhouse growers. Uh, Bradford, next weekend, Carrot Fest. We are the heart of Canada's vegetable uh, industry, as well as uh, I have a history of growing, a four-time best-selling garden author, uh, each and every day on uh, Breakfast Television, City TV Toronto. You can see me there giving the weather. I'm wild about weather, passionate about plants, and I'm here to help you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Okay, um, so of course you can get in there and answer those questions and ask the questions. Um, first thing that I really wanted to talk about, and I, I, we got lots of shout outs this morning already. We have Matthew on there, Marlene this morning, Pierre Cho saying good morning, Kathy Wood, Kim Waddy as well. There's Kim's right there saying good morning from Stratford this morning. We have Carrie as well saying good morning out there, and Kathy as well saying good morning. So one thing I want to talk about, because I'm anticipating we're going to get this question. Uh, there's Lori saying good morning from Bowmanville as well. Uh, I'm anticipating we're going to get a question about people's tomatoes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share a screen here. And as we go over to a Chrome tab, I'm going to go to boom, 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 boom. And I'm going to share this. I'm anticipating we're probably going to get a question today, a little bit about what people's tomatoes are starting to look like. And what that is, is the appearance of not only on tomatoes, but you can also see it as also on peppers. You can see that pepper plant that's there. We start to get that blacking on the bottom of the tomato and or the pepper. Uh, so even and sometimes the top looks perfect, but you look at the bottoms and the bottoms have that kind of brownish black and or sometimes even just discarding. And this can happen on tomatoes, but also could even happen peppers, zucchinis as well. Uh, and it can appear, appear on many of them. And if you're wondering what the heck is this, this is something called blossom end rot. Blossom end rot typically happens when we do have extreme periods of different variations of moisture, meaning that we go from drought to wet. So a lot of the times the inconsistent watering can be a result of this. It can be uh, due to a lot of temperature swings, high temperatures. But the main thing, it's due to a calcium deficiency. So using fertilizers that are calcium enriched, miracle Grow has the shake and feed for tomatoes with that uh, red top that really does have extra calcium in it. It's pretty key to make sure that you don't uh, get blossom end rot. But let's say that you do have blossom end rot at this time. What I encourage you to do is to remove any of the fruit, be it the tomatoes, be it the peppers, uh, be it the zucchinis, remove the fruit, and then hopefully the new ones that come on will have uh, little to no blossom end rot or signs of blossom end rot. Consistent watering and then fertilize. You can still fertilize right now. Even a water soluble that does have some calcium will really be a benefit for you too as well. Um, uh, we have Cynthia here this morning, which is saying hello from Niagara on the Lake. Saw you at the Two Sisters event. Just to let you know, uh, speaking of the Two Sisters event, we're planning one coming up again in the fall to celebrate the harvest. So I will be back at Two Sisters Winery in Niagara on the Lake. Also coming up on the morning of August the 24th on Breakfast Television, I'm going to be live from a peach farm to talk about the benefits of, uh, well, just the joys of Ontario peaches that are out there. Um, we have another question this morning as well. This is from Lois. Good morning. Our grass in Stratford is looking like grubs or cinch bugs, but is not showing either on testing. What do you recommend we do next? Sometimes your lawn uh, will go through a period of dormancy. Uh, we've had, and right now we're starting to have some cooler nights, which we're going to start to see your lawn bounce back a bit as long as you're doing that one inch of watering per week. Uh, the really benefit too is that summer guard fertilizing. Uh, uh, summer fertilizing is really key. You can still do that, but you're going to want to really do a fertilizing when it comes to Thanksgiving weekend. That's the next big fertilizing time that we're going to use a fall formulated fertilizer that really sets our lawns off for winter. But the key is, is if your lawn's going through some browning, uh, that browning can just be a natural way of the lawn trying to 
put itself into dormancy. So we'll always cut the blades a little bit taller. Uh, testing for cinch bugs, the best thing you can do to test for cinch bugs, sometimes even laying a, a white towel on the lawn in the, near those brown areas, you'll actually see the little blackish red bug that hops onto the towel, that's cinch bugs. You can either take, a, let's say that you had a, a tomato or even a juice can, metal juice can, you cut the top and bottom, you shove it into the ground, you fill it with water, and you usually see the cinch bugs uh, surface to the top. To test for grubs, you're better off to take a one by one section of the lawn, peel the sod back, and just dig in the lawn. If you see four grubs in that period, then you have an issue with grubs. Grub be gone is really key for that as well. Uh, but really what I recommend for you to do next is if you haven't done a summer guard fertilizer, do that. Raise your lawnmower blades and just apply a little bit more uh, moisture to the lawn because we have been pretty dry overall. Uh, here we go. We got another question this morning in Newmarket. This has to do with the lawn too. Uh, what to do about tiny flies in my lawn? I'm also fighting grubs with grub be gone. So of course, grub be gone is the best. The tiny flies that you could see there could even be a sod webworm that's happening. The key in summer months is that one inch of watering per week. Cutting your lawn on your lawnmower it should be at a three or four setting. So that taller grass will cut the blades a little shorter, cut the lawn that is a little bit shorter in September. The little flies, I'd love to know what the little flies appear and or look like. Sometimes they could be cinch bugs as well but we need to know, but really the key is grub be gone as well. If you, you are using grub be gone, the lawn has to be wet first, then the grub be gone has to be applied and then it has to be watered in. The application of it's quite key. So if we have a period of rain, applying grub be gone after that rain and then watering it in, that's kind of better than anything else. Uh, this is Lou. Uh, Food to Grow is my go-to, just an amazing book. Thank you so much. Uh, all the books that I've done, the four books that I've done, I put my heart and soul into them. I worked alongside a great team, Shannon, who is my photographer, Kate, who is one of the persons that put the book together. Uh, the key is right now is I'm trying to get Harper Collins to put Food to Grow back into print, and I'm trying to get them to put my other titles back into print uh, because they're all sold out. So if you have a copy, keep a copy. If you're done with your copy, you can put it out there for uh, sale on used, and you'll probably do quite well on it. Um, here's, we go with another question this morning. Um, Shirley, how do I know if I'm watering too much for my tomatoes and what do they look like if, uh, not enough water? So watering your tomatoes, tomato plants at this time of the year are quite big, right? So they're very big. If they're in containers, you almost want to water the container once, go back, water your garden and come back and water that tomato plant again. A key is just looking at the soil. If you're watering too much, the soil will be consistently sitting wet all the time. If we're seeing your tomatoes start to droop a little bit, that drooping can also be due to too little or too much water. So before you water, always take a look at the soil. Remove any of those bottom leaves so they're not touching the soil. So that will actually eliminate some of the pathogens and disease that your tomato plant can get. So that's kind of key as well. But with our tomatoes, if we start to see those leaves droop and then the leaves are starting to turn the other way, that's when they're really, really too dry. Uh, I would very much uh, guess that you're not watering too much right now because it has been a dry season and tomatoes can take a lot of water. Uh, just don't do overhead watering. Key for tomatoes and watering is watering just their roots, trying to keep the water off the foliage. That'll reduce and eliminate a lot of disease that's out there. Hey, good shout out to my friends in the East Coast this morning. Lisa, good morning from Newfoundland. Good morning to you on the rock still a place that I need to visit. I do. Mm. I've been to New Brunswick. I've been to PEI. I've yet to been to Nova Scotia and or also Newfoundland. Uh, there's that question again. Uh, here's another little shout out this morning as well. Bradley, good morning, my good friend. Good morning to you as well. Rosemary, name of one of my favorite herbs. Rosemary, how's it going? Uh, anyone else having trouble with flocks of spot, quite spotty and yellow leaves? I anticipated this question as well. So let's go to the Chrome tab. Okay, sometimes I actually know the questions before the questions even happen, just based upon. So at this time of the year, uh, phlox, uh, which is a beautiful flowering perennial plant, tend to get uh, powdery mildew. Uh, so you can start to see the phlox, even they can get some of the yellowing, but really what you start to see develop is this on the leaves. Powdery mildew, of course, is a disease, a fungus, Often they're a result of poor air circulation in your garden in an overcrowded garden. Phlox are just susceptible to uh, powdery mildew. This year, because of the heat, the humidity that we've had, 
uh, powdery mildew has a little bit been far greater. So flocks have struggled. There are a few varieties of flocks that you can purchase that are uh, powdery mildew resistant. So you can look for some of those varieties of flocks that are powdery mildew resistant. And uh, this has been just a challenging year for flocks overall, but it's still a beautiful flowering plant uh, that can even work well as a cut flower as well. Uh, Miriam, my good friend, Miriam, good morning. Uh, how are you, dear? Would you please tell us how to use liquid stimulator to use to grow uh, rosa um, sherry? <coughs> Excuse me, forgive me there. A little tickle in my nose. Um, rosa sharon plant out of a branch as double petals of rosa sharon. It doesn't have seeds or do they have seeds? Please let me know. A lot of the times you're better off if you want to have a true variety of something like a double petal rosa sharon, you do want to do a stem root cutting. Sometimes what we can do for those stem root cuttings is that rosa sharon will be branching out quite a bit and we can go to the base of some of the new branches that are coming out and we can actually take one of those more tender new shoots and actually pin it right into the soil. So by pinning into the soil, we look and take a look in there four to six weeks, it'll actually set a root. You can just cut it and go from there. The other thing you can do is when you are taking a cutting or you're taking a stem of any plant, especially hardwood, we always want to take a cutting and or shoot from some of the softer, newest growth, never the older stems. It has to be some of the smaller stems. Uh, we want to make sure that the height of that is only about two inches. It has to have a few leaves on it. And all you're doing is dipping that stem, that uh, that bottom of the stem into the stem, into the stem root, usually is the root stimulator that you're using. It's usually a pink powder that you dip it in. And then you're going to do several of them. Don't just try to do one or two because some of them will fail. You do several. You can do it in 50% uh, potting soil, 50% garden soil. Mix the two together so it's a little heavier mix. Do them in pots and you should do well. Or you can just kind of root them right in the garden because we still have some time this year. And you can do it from there. So there you go with uh, and good question there, Miriam, as well. Um, here we go for Joanne. My tomatoes are beautiful, best in the last few years. So because this summer has been hot, it has actually has been sunny. We've had light units. We've had heat units. As long as we provided the tomatoes with adequate moisture, we removed the bottom branches and we fertilized and we had good soil. Tomatoes are great. They're fantastic. I've, I've had so many cherry tomatoes. I mean, tons of cherry tomatoes. My tomatoes are just coming on right now because they planted a little bit later, but my heirlooms are just starting to color up now and they're pretty good. But I did have a little blossom and rot because I did go away for a weekend once at a cottage with my kids. And then I was away, of course, in Holland. Hey, speaking of which, I told you guys I would show you some pictures. I'm just going to go to that right now. And we're going to go up here and I'm going to go boom. And I'm going to share another tab and I'm going to go share a tab from my Facebook page. And as we share this tab from my Facebook page, if you take a look at my Facebook, you you could see that I did share some pictures of Floriad, Floriad the Expo. That's the reason why I was away. What's amazing about this statue here, if you take a look at the statue, that statue is actually a collection of cut out bees, cut out bees in a metal. And then they, of course, turned into um, that rusted color. Beautiful plantings there, the dahlias. But the one thing that the Netherlands and uh, the Dutch have always done really well is rhythmic planting. And what I mean by rhythmic planting, if we take a look at this garden here, we can see that there is indeed, even though it looks like it is a cottage type wild planting, there's actually a pattern and or rhythm within that natural planting. And that's something that the Dutch have done in their flower bulbs, in their annuals. They have done it with such perfection. And that's the reason why People like Van Gogh, Monet, and Rembrandt have been inspired by the Dutch through history. This is an amazing new school that was built at Floriad. And of course, they're using green technologies, green wall technologies that you could see there. Practical Is this practical for Ontario? For many areas in Canada, it would be very hard to sustain the plant material during the winter months. But in some areas, we can go ahead. But especially what we can do here is green roofs. My question is, here's an example of a sky rise, a high condo building. And what they've done with this condo building to make it set within nature is they've actually, instead of using brick, they've used a, a really big, really art installation. So they've done uh, what, what is there, uh, really a floral print. And that floral print, of course, is something that, that is quite amazing overall. So let me just get back here. Sorry about that. Um, so that's pretty cool overall. 
as well, we take a look at some of the beautiful food stations and whatnot that they have. You can take a look here that we do have, if you're wondering what that plant is in the front that's planted there, uh, that is uh, artichoke. That is artichoke. And artichoke actually makes a very, very funky looking flower that's there. There's a look again. Cool thing about this is you see the plant, the uh, buildings that you have and the mushrooms that are there. This building here was actually uh, made from mushroom roots mixed in with flax and or hemp to create a material that creates a soundproof insulation, which is quite cool as well. This is one of the um, one of the installations and you can see the hydrangeas in the front and how dry they are because it's been dry in the Netherlands as well. This installation was done by China and it had a real focus on bamboo as a sustainable product. And you can see the bamboo that's there as well, really great. This was one of the installations by India. Uh, that's a little look at Mumbai and the colors, of course, vibrant colors that are there. This here was one of the um, one of the buildings that they were trying to show new technologies and of course fungi, but we can actually see planted in front there. That is not marijuana, that is indeed hemp. Uh, there's another look at one of the residential areas that they have started to build. Uh, one of them is a seniors facility that does have therapeutic gardens that are built throughout. There's a look at the natural pavilion where they're showing nature's technology because nature in itself is the technology. Then when you go inside to a greenhouse, you start to see some of the hydroponics and aquaponics that they're using to grow. And then, of course, just some of the wonderful flowers that are out there as well, especially some of the tropical plants overall. And it was just something that I really enjoyed, and that was happiness in its purest form that's there. So that's a little gander into uh, my trip to, of course, uh, Floriat. I just got to give a text here because, uh, uh, yeah, yes, my cousin just said, you're live. Yes. I'm going to say until 930. This is, see, so you guys get to see real, real time here. That what I'm uh, like, Carlo, I'll get back to you, buddy. He's maybe even watching me right now. Um, so let's get into some other questions that are here. Uh, we got another question here about a climbing hydrangea. Uh, this is from Sharon Martin. Uh, hey, Frankie, good morning from Mono. Okay, beautiful area, by the way. My climbing hydrangea has never bloomed. Green and climbing, sun until about 3 p.m. Thanks. Uh, some of the climbing hydrangeas will do put on a lot of growth that's there overall. A lot of the times that can just be that it's getting a lot of nitrogen, a lot of feed. It's getting sun until about three, so that should be adequate sunlight. What I would do is this fall, give it a fairly significant pruning. I would prune it back quite a bit. And then also what I would do is go around uh, just, just beyond the roots. So about where it's planted up against that trellis end or wall, go back about uh, 30 inches and then just take a spade and shove that spade down. What that's going to do is cut some of the roots and kind of uh, stimulate that plant. You could do that in September, but after we actually have a few frosts is when I would do a fairly significant pruning, almost to half its size, and hopefully that would actually kick it back into uh, getting it to bloom overall. Sometimes it's maturity. Uh, a lot of the hydrangeas as well won't start blooming until they're at least five to six years old. So it could just be that you're just not patient at this moment and those are some of the other reasons but a lot of the times if you're getting any runoff that's coming off on your um from your lawn and that fertilizer is going into that area where the to, uh, where the hydrangea climbing hydrangea is planted you'll get a lot of foliage but you will not get um you will not get uh the bloom that's happening uh francis giving a shout out in newfoundland as well we're seeing some rain here today which is great because we did have lots of forest fire dry conditions in Newfoundland, of course, in uh, Western Canada as well. It has been a year where we're dry in many areas of Canada and the United States and of course, Europe. Uh, so this is this is climate change. And if there's something that you want to do, plant a tree, grow a tree, every garden that you put in, you're creating something that's good for the environment. Encourage communities to do community gardens. There's so much that we can do and there's so much we can do in our homes and outside of our homes to benefit the environment and to benefit the future for our kids, grandkids, and generations beyond. Uh, Marlene, I'm only seeing my comments been happening for weeks now. Okay, well, Marlene, uh, if you can, you can probably go in and open it. I know that uh, Facebook has set some different settings that are there, and I'm gonna go in and see if I can make some changes as well to see if that's if there's something that's happening there too, because that could be on my end, but I'm not gonna do it right this moment, um, but I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna make a note here about comments on Facebook to see if it's on my end. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so um, another question, comment, M Mal uh, or Mail. Lovely day from Rosso. Amazing. I was in Rosso yesterday. My son is up there at camp. Uh, the San Marzano uh, tomato leaves have spots and have droop. Tomatoes are still in the plants. Hope they will ripen. They will ripen overall. Those little dots that you're seeing on the leaves 
of course, can be either a disease and or insect. If the leaves, leaves are really starting to droop or dropped, it could be a fusarium wilt. If that's the case, then we have a bigger issue. So uh, May, oh, I thought it was an L, it's May, M-A-I-E. Uh, if you can send me a picture of Frankie at FrankieFlowers.com, Frankie at FrankieFlowers.com uh, for an email, then I can actually take a look. Here we go with uh, Leslie this morning. Uh, hey, Frankie, I have a few different hydrangea plants in my garden. I don't know what varieties they are. How do I know if and when to prune them? So generally, if you have a white global-shaped hydrangea or a cone-shaped hydrangea, those bloom on new wood. If your hydrangeas are pink and or purple, blue, and they have a really thick, glossy green leaf, those hydrangeas are macrophilias that bloom on old wood. So we don't prune those. We actually just remove the flower heads. And that's the easiest way to describe it. I'm actually going to do a video on how to tell what your hydrangea variety is. See, I'm taking notes here. All of a sudden, I got the schneezes. Don't worry. I actually got tested for random testing. Let me tell you a little bit about travel right now. I'm going to take a little departure here from my, my Facebook here. Um, so with travel, I did a carry-on. So I did carry-on for eight days. Worked out fantastic. I'll probably only do carry-ons now. Way better. I flew KLM to Amsterdam, KLM there and back. There are no delays back, had about an hour delay. No problem. Great. Really good. Um, got back, driving home, got through customs pretty good, driving home. I almost get home, get an email. You've been selected for random testing. Okay, cool. Okay, what do I do? I look. Closest place for me to do a walk in PCR, because that's what you need for a random test, was in Aurora at the Shoppers Drug Mart. I go to Aurora at the Shoppers Drug Mart. There's lots of people there. Lots of people that are there. Sorry about that. Wiping out my hands. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I got nothing around me right now. I'm in my home. I'll wash my hands after. Uh, so I do my random testing. They're busy. Um, that was on a Friday on my return. Right away. Went there. Needed to get done in a day. Kind of stressed out. So then I checked my email on Saturday. Nothing. Sunday. Nothing for results. M Monday. Nothing. So before I went to work... I tested myself with my own home test. I'm negative. I'm feeling great. Uh, Tuesday, no results. Wednesday, Wednesday, I finally get results. And the results say that I'm fine. Of course. What if I was? What if I wasn't and I went around? Like, what's the purpose right now? What's the purpose? That's what I just got to say. Okay, that was just my rant. Uh, we got the hydrangea question already that was there. Um, Marie or Mary or Marie. I like Marie. Marie. Uh, I used to have trouble with tomatoes, uh, but use crushed eggshells when I plant them now. Yeah, of course. That's the one thing that we can do to add in some calcium, just even a little bit of calcium. What calcium does is allow that tomato plant to take in nutrients easier. So at planting time with tomatoes, crush up some eggshells and plant them in or even mix them in the soil where you have your tomato garden. Fantastic overall. So that's uh, a really good tip that's there. Rosie saying good morning uh, as well. Rose, Rosie, just let you know my cousin Rosie is here from Italy which is great to see that as well. Uh, we have a good morning shout out as well from Valerie from Cope Town. Uh, when I water the plants this year, there are little white flying bugs. Can't figure out what they are. Aphids. So if this is indoors, your little white, fly, uh, white flying bugs indoors is generally white fly. And you can have white fly outside as well. Uh, white fly, you can use an insecticidal soap to take care of, yellow sticky traps, White fly indoors can be hard to control. If it's just a few plants, I would really recommend you putting those plants outside, spraying those to keep it contained. Um, if it's coming from the soil, even though you may think they're white, it could be fungus gnats, especially indoors. Uh, white aphids tend not to be uh, uh, really not visible when you go to water. When you water, it's not going to disturb them. So I would guess it's white fly. So once again, that insecticidal soap, like a bug be gone, treat for white fly. If they are plants that are indoors, move them outside during the time that's warm, give them treatments outside, and then bring them back after. So that's that. Um, here we go with a question about strawberries. Uh, how to harvest straw flowers? When to pick? Oh, this is the question for straw flowers. So straw flowers actually when they bloom is when they come out and they're already a dried material. Uh, if you want to just do a bouquet, you can do a bouquet and actually hang them upside down and allow them to fully dry. That's probably the best thing that you can do. Hang them upside down in an area that's going to be uh, dark, uh, but nice and dry and fairly warm. It doesn't need to be in sun. It's best to have them dry like in a garage. Hang them in your garage upside down, cut them, 
and away you go. As long as the flower is full, it's coming into full bloom. You can do that even if they're just kind of cracking bud. You can harvest some like that too. And then you can use them as a dry flower inside your home. Or you can cut them and put them in vases and uh, use them as just a cut flower as well. Amanda. Lord, Frankie. Hi, Amanda. Uh, Bradley. How are you doing today? My friend, love BT. Thanks for watching us, guys. I love being on BT. We have lots of fun on BT. We sing, we dance, we give you information. We're trying to give you a smile. And that's what we're trying to do. Trying to make your life better. That's my goal too. You know, I'm here each and every Sunday. Uh, sometimes I get some sponsorships that help me out and things like that. But often I'm just here just to give, share time with you. So for instance, today is the day I'm just sharing time for you. Not being compensated by it, but what I'm being compensated by is the knowledge. And even if I don't use it, I'm going to lose it. So I often love to kind of challenge myself to try to figure out what's happening in your gardens, to try to figure out how I can actually learn more, be better, and actually help provide better information that's out there. Um, here's another, uh, Sharon, forgot to say the hydrangea is six years old. Uh, so that is one of the hydrangea varieties for pruning. Pruning is really key. Oh, the hydrangea in terms of the climbing hydrangea is six years old. So I would do a, a root pruning on that for sure. Like I said, with that spade and then cut it back this fall overall and just watch out where, how it's being fertilized. Uh, Arlie, I would like to plant a small hedge between my neighbor and us. What do you suggest that winters well and low maintenance? I was thinking of planting Hicks U. Hicks U's, Hills U's, probably the better of, of them, uh, way better uh, selection than uh, any boxwood that's out there. They're fairly hardy. Uh, the hills, probably a little bit better for a little shorter. Hicks will actually grow quite tall. Hills is a little bit of a shorter variety that's easily pruned as well. So check out Hills U. Now, Mel is asking a question. What spray is good to remove bugs that eat plant leaves? They are ruining mine. So we got to figure out what the bug is. If it's a beetle, then we can use something called Beetle Be Gone. If it's just like something like an aphid, then we can use... Uh, a bug be gone, which is an insecticidal soap. So first thing is, what is the bug that's causing the issue? Let's say that it's a slug. Uh, if it's a slug, it's a crawling insect. So then we got to use a slug bait or something to do like a diatomaceous earth to take care of that. So we got to figure out the type of bug. So if you want to send me a picture of the holes in your plant leaves, Mel, Frankie at frankieflowers.com and I'll help you there. Um, Gwen, we removed a large pine tree and now I'm having a hard time growing grass there. Why? So that pine tree, when that pine tree is there, all those needles that fall, they actually acidify the soil. Because the soil is highly acidic and your lawn wants more of a neutral soil, then what you need to do is actually neutralize the acidity caused by those pine needles. What I would recommend is using a horticultural lime. Applying that horticultural lime, mixing it in with some new soil in that area will neutralize uh, that acidity done by the pine needles. You may have to do a few applications while the lawn's growing. And over time, it'll get back to being a neutral soil overall. Here's a question for Winnie this morning. Hi, Frankie. I have a big looking fly around my hydrangea. Is it a good bug? Winnie, if there's no holes in your hydrangeas, a lot of the times we do have a lot of beneficial bugs, even some parasitic wasps that are out there. That can be good. It's hard for me to tell what it is. It's just a big flying bug. So it'd be great if you can capture a picture of it, Winnie. Frankie at Frankie Flowers. But if it's doing no harm, it is doing well for you. Uh, Matthew saying he loves my books. Thanks, Matthew, overall as well. Amanda Lord, good morning from Sudbury. My New Guinea patients are doing so well. Do you think they'll survive if I bring them in as a house plant? Really hard to survive as a house plant indoors just due to light units. It's worth a try. A lot of them to dry out slightly in between waterings. But Amanda, in my experience, when you bring them inside, they'll last maybe up until the beginning to the beginning of November. And then they're really, really hard because we just don't have enough light units to help them out. Um, here we go. Uh, Denise, how do you get rid of creeping Charlie from my lawn? Hand removal is the easiest way to do that. Thickening up the lawn. Creeping Charlie, of course, as much as you remove it, it can then cause another break. So then it breaks off and grows a little bit thicker. But if we thicken up the lawn, cut the lawn more, uh, cut the lawn a little higher and continue to try to hand remove even some of those larger patches, it'll be really helpful for you. You can try using Weed Be Gone. Weed Be Gone is done by Scott's as well, but it, it might... In my experience, it doesn't really work as well for some of the uh, things that are perennial weeds like a Creeping Charlie. So hand removal, but using Weed Be Gone uh, for others is really good for you as well. So uh, we got good morning from Tobamori. Charlene, good morning to you. Uh, we have another one here this morning. Good morning, Frankie. Nice shirt. I bought seed potatoes and onion starts early in the spring. I just found them in the cupboard and realized I forgot to plant them. Are they trash or they can be used uh, in the fall? 
in, in the fall, following spring. Most likely they are trash, but what you could do is with the onion sets, the seed potatoes are done. Um, with the onion sets, you can actually plant some of them now and you might even be able to just to get some green tops and you can use some onion tops for those. Uh, they're, they'll, they won't be viable for next season. Sorry, I wish it. Seeds, so seeds will actually be viable. But things like some of the bulbs, if they're not stored properly, they'll dry out. And a lot of the time, especially seed potatoes, they'll start to go, they'll start to rot. They won't have good success. Um, but even just trying to put the onions in right now, you may get just some nice green tops that you can use for you. Uh, as to why. Good morning. We got another good morning, Frankie, this morning from Penny. Uh, Shirley saying thanks this morning so much, Frankie. Uh, we have a question about, I think, a burning bush. Carrie, my burning bush has what looks like a square stock now. It's very stocky looking. That's what Euonymus alata. That's the variety, which is it's from the Euonymus family. The, the stalks in them will get square over time. Uh, you can prune your burning bush at any time of the year. You can shape it, prune it. And pruning, I encourage you to do because that does thicken it up. Prune by no more than one third at a time. And make sure you're doing it on an overcast and or cooler day. Either do it in the morning and or later in the evening. Never during the heat of the day. It'll cause too much stress. We got a good morning from Bolton this morning. We're going to answer to one more question as well or and or comment from Dunchurch this morning. Uh, now that my goat's beard has finished flowering, should I cut the dead flowers off or leave them on? Mary, that is called deadheading and indeed remove the flowers after they finish. That'll put more energy to the plant. Any perennials that you have in your garden that have finished blooming, unless you want to allow some of the seeds to stay there, like echinacea and cone flowers, we can shake the seed heads. But often we're deadheading and removing the flowers to put more energy to the plant to create healthier plants. We do that especially with animals. So for all those that joined me today, I hope your day was fantastic. We're just out 32 minutes this morning. Uh, once again, I'm here each and every Sunday. Uh, get on the, some of the comments there. I'll make sure that we can see the comments as well. Um, I hope you guys have a fantastic Sunday. The weather is beautiful here. I'm going to venture out with my son Matheson today because Gavin is indeed at camp. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got some weeding to do too. So turn your garden of weeding into the garden of Eden. Frankie Flowers, I'm out for Sunday. See you next